practicing that song this morning when I walked into the foyer and I thought somebody was playing a CD. It sounded so good and it was good. It was good. Thank you for that, ladies. Uh, Brother Wheat, good to see you tonight. You're number one. He's got his finger in a big old bandage. That's why you're wondering what I did all that for. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right, before, uh, open your Bible to Hebrews 12, please, Hebrews chapter 12, and I uh, want to just wrap up the little, I started this a couple weeks ago on don't be a wimpy parent, but before I do that, I want to kind of make a couple of announcements. I think if my calendar in my mind is correct, so it probably isn't, um, next Sunday is the last Sunday of July, is that right? Okay. And then that means the following Sunday is cottage prayer meetings. The first Sunday in August will be our cottage prayer meetings. I'll get more detail about that out this week on email. And then the following Sunday after that is homecoming. And then the Sunday after that, I'll be in Texas preaching um, a revival. I'll be preaching Monday through... Anyways, I won't be here that Sunday night. So I need to wrap up this series tomorrow night or next Sunday night. So... So you all pray for me, okay? I need to do that, and uh, looking forward to that. But the series is called Learning from the Mistakes of Others. I think I've done this every night, but I'll do it again. Have anybody ever made a mistake? Yeah. <laughs> Only Brother Roger has not made a mistake. Well, I'm glad we can learn from our mistakes, but I'm even more glad we can learn from somebody else's mistakes so we don't make those. And we've learned so far several things very quickly. We've learned from David, don't follow your flesh. From Manasseh, don't turn your back on God. From Judas, don't be a sellout. From the early church, don't take a chance with your future. From the Corinthians, don't dwell on the past. From the ants in the book of Proverbs, don't have a summer slump. From Jonah, we learned uh, don't run from God. And, and I hope we're going to learn tonight once again, uh, don't be a wimpy parent. Don't be a wimpy parent. If you recall from last week, well, not last week, but two, uh, two weeks ago, we began this little two-week session on don't be a wimpy parent. We talked about from Eli and how he was a wimpy parent and who paid the price was his boys. We'll review that in just a moment. But I think tonight we, we may, cross your fingers, we may get out a little bit early. Many of us was here all week this week, every night till 9 o'clock or so. Maybe some past that, so maybe tonight we can get home early and get a good night's sleep. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. Good deal. All right. All right. Hebrews 12, stand to your feet, please, and uh, look in Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews 12. <clears throat> Hebrews 12 is called the discipline chapter. It's also very, very good 
uh, encouragement for us in the first part of the verse and in the chapter in verse 4 and following is about discipline. So look please in Hebrews chapter 12, look in verse 4. <clears throat> Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which spake, speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when, he, when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with, dealeth with you as with sons, for... What son is whom, whom he hath, the father chasteneth not? Let me read that again because I totally messed that up. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. And here's the important part. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. And furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which correcteth us and we gave them reverence, shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? That's a very important question. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. In other words, there's a reason God chastens us. Verse 11. Now no chastening, for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. I want to preach on this thought again this evening. Don't be a wimpy parent. Don't be a wimpy parent. The thoughts I'm going to say tonight, I, I wish someone preached these to me about 20 years ago. And uh, I wish I would have been a better, done a better job disciplining and, uh, and uh, hopefully I won't pay the price for that. But I do want to try to help you tonight. And the title is called, Don't Be a Wimpy Parent, if you're writing notes, part two. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the good music tonight. And thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. We appreciate Elijah getting saved this morning. What a blessing. All the week's work was worth it, Lord, to see Elijah saved today. Thank you for that. Thank you for that blessing. And I pray tonight, God, as we open your word, I pray that we might uh, learn something from your word that will help us, whether we're a parent or a grandparent, whether we work with children, whether we have children in our, in our life. God, I pray you take the next few moments, Lord, and uh, the brief time we have, and bless your word to our hearts. I do pray for us as parents, you may convict us where we need to be convicted, and, and, and uh, Lord, comfort us where we need to be comforted, God, and challenge us, Lord, however we need to be done tonight. Would you do that for us, and we'll be forever grateful. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you can have a seat, please. I appreciate you standing up and being here tonight. I don't take the Sunday night service lightly. I love the Sunday night service. My, my favorite one of the whole week. I know I've been working all week, and you've worked this morning, and you just want to come tonight and relax for a while. I hope we can do that. But if you have your outline, please, I want to look back at last week and just very quickly review. I, I put on your outline the, the, the points from last week. Maybe you weren't here. Maybe you just need a refresher or, or two weeks ago. And Eli, we learned, Eli was the man of God. He was the prophet. He was the, he was the one who was the spiritual leader, and yet he did not take home what he should have taken home. He let his boys get by with way too much, and it, it cost them very dearly. He was a wimpy parent. And the results from two weeks ago about being a wimpy parent, number one, wimpy parenting will have negative consequences. Number two, if children are not taught to obey their parents, how can we expect them to obey the Lord? Number three, when children are not trained to follow guidelines, they make up their own. Uh, Hophni and Phinehas, they made up their own rules two weeks ago because their dad didn't enforce the rules that he, that he had. Verse, or number four, children that don't obey their parents will not obey other authorities. Number five, wimpy parents take no action when their children disobey. Number six, wimpy parents confuse leniency for love. We often think, well, if we're, if we're easy on our kids, they'll love us more, and that's just not the case. Verse, number seven, I mean, wimpy parenting ruins the godly heritage that we could have had. If you remember from two weeks ago, the priestly lineage is ended right there with, with, with Eli. It should have been cast down to his sons, but because of their rebellion, it, it couldn't. 
And then the last point from last week was wimpy parenting is afraid to lose their children without realizing they have already been lost. So that was the results of wimpy parenting. So I want to spend the next couple of moments tonight and talk to you about the remedy for wimpy parenting. The remedy for wimpy parenting, and it has to do with, with discipline. Right from our text this morning, I want to give you very quickly five, five uh, principles, if you will, about, about discipline in our homes. I want you to think about Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, it ends, I mean, it begins, I mean, some very encouraging verses. It, it says, wherefore, in Hebrews 12 verse 1, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, talking about those from Hebrews chapter 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for whom the joy uh, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the, verse, the, the chapter begins very positively. I mean, we're encouraged to be faithful. We're encouraged to look to God and we're encouraged to look at the other examples that we have in our life. And we're talking about here in verse 4, down in verse 11, about, about discipline. And there are some other verses I want to read to you that also talk about discipline. Uh, Proverbs 13, 24, the Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. That means every time your kids need it, they ought to get discipline. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Proverbs 23, 13 through 14 says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs 29, 15 and through 17 says, The rod of and reproof giveth wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth, but the righteous shall see their fall. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest, yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. You say, well, man, that sounds kind of mean. <laughs> These verses tell us we're supposed to beat our children. No, that's not what these verses are saying. God never tells us to beat our children. And it's never right to beat our children, never right to, to uh, uh, abuse our children. It's never right. It's never good. It's never justified. As a matter of fact, Jesus said over in, in the New Testament that it's better for a person who abuses a child, it's better for him to have a millstone tied around his neck and thrown into the depths of the sea and drowned. So God is never for child abuse, never for beating our children, but He is for us disciplining our children because you know what our Father does when we do wrong? He disciplines us. It's never right to abuse a child, but it's always right to discipline a child when they need it. If you have your notes out, look at number one, uh, these five very quick principles. Number one, the necessity of discipline is to deter destruction. To deter destruction. Look back in chapter uh, 12, verse 4. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. If you take a moment and look back in Hebrews chapter 10, notice in verse 38 the Bible says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. The Bible talks about, the writer of Hebrews talks about, that there'll be a generation, there'll be some people who they draw back from the faith and they don't do what they're supposed to do and they don't live how they're supposed to live and those people uh, will be destroyed. They'll, and God has no pleasure in them. The Bible says that they draw back unto per, perdition but unto them that believe to the saving of their soul. So there is a group of people, there are some people who will not always be faithful, they'll not always stand for God, not always live right. And, and he says that in the end of chapter 10, 
But in chapter 11, he gives us uh, uh, about 20-some-odd folks who in the Bible, they were faithful. They did stand for God. They did make a difference. They, they were uh, faithful to do what they're supposed to do. They, they did do right. So there's examples of those who, who, who did do right. And in verse chapter 12, we're, we start off by talking about how we're encouraged to, to, to do right and to be strong and to be faithful. But then in chapter 4, God says, well, and if you're not you're going to be punished. If not, you're going to be disciplined. If not, you're going to be chastised. And why is that? We're, we're chastised. We are, we are disciplined. We are punished, if you will, to keep us from destruction. I say to we who are parents, the same thing is true with us. We discipline our children so they won't be destroyed. How many folks do we know of in jail? Their lives are destroyed. And of course it's their fault. You're responsible for your own actions, but a mom and dad back at home who had a disciplined home could have saved them a whole lot of trouble. <clears throat> Let me say this to our young people. When your parents punish you for being disobedient, they're trying to keep you from being destroyed. And so the first thought tonight is this, the necessity of discipline is to deter destruction. Look in verse 5, please, you'll see our next point. The means of discipline is actions and words. The means of discipline is actions and words. Look in verse 5, please. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which spaketh unto you as unto children. Listen carefully, please. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Notice there's two important words in verse number 5. There's the word chastening and the word rebuked. The word chastening in our context, it means taking appropriate actions. And the word rebuke means using proper language. In other words, real discipline, real training, real teaching involves chastening, it involves taking proper actions, it also involves using proper language. In other words, there must be actions and there must be words if we're going to train our children. My baseball coach in high school, one of the best coaches I've ever even been around, name is Coach Chaffin, we called him Butch, Butch Chaffin. And uh, one of my mentors, I guess you will, taught me how to drive a stick shift and all kind of good stuff like that. I liked the number 29 because that was his number, so I wore it the rest of my career in honor of him. And uh, a great man, a great coach, and uh, still coaching my high school some, oh wow, almost 30 years later. Goodness gracious, man, he's getting old. But anyways, uh, I, I remember in baseball practice, he, when, you, when you messed up, he just wouldn't say, well, you messed up. Do it right. No, he would show you how to do it right. If your swing was wrong, he'd show you, no, your swing is wrong, do it like this. If you missed a ground ball and he saw some kind of thing you did wrong, he would say, no, you do it like this. You spread your feet, you get down and whatever, get your hand up. We call it the gator hand. Get your gator hand up. If you messed up, yes, he got on to you, but he also showed you the right way. There was chastening and there was rebuke. Good discipline involves taking appropriate actions and also using proper language. <clears throat> Grounding or spanking doesn't work if there's no verbal teaching. All that does is cause confusion. <clears throat> when God chastens us, He also shows us in His Word what to do right. There's a lot of thou shalt nots. And with all the thou shalt nots, there's also an, uh, an explanation on, on why thou shalt not. And here's how to do right. Don't do wrong, but here's the right to do. And we as parents and we as grandparents, we, we, we must get to the point to where we, yes, we punish for the wrong, uh, we take the appropriate action, but we also must rebuke, we must teach how to do right. <clears throat> if all we do is show them what's wrong and never teach them what's right, they'll never know how to do right. Or they'll learn it from somebody else and it may not be right. 
So when disciplining our children, if we're not going to be wimpy parents, there must be a combination of taking appropriate actions and also using proper language. Number three, notice very quickly from down from verse 6 to verse 9, the motive of discipline is to express love. You'd have a hard time convincing me of that 35 years ago that my parents loved me. They didn't really ever tell me they loved me, but they sure did show me they loved me when they disciplined me. I didn't realize that was Bible doctrine back in the day, but it is. Disciplining our children is not child abuse no matter what society says. But on the contrary, not disciplining our children could be child of, uh, abuse. But the motivation should always be love. The Bible says back in verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. The reason God disciplines us when we do wrong is because he loves us. And the reason when we err from the way and he tries to get us back on track is because he loves us. And the reason why he'll not let us sin and get by with us is because he loves us. And any time we discipline our children, it ought to be that of love. And we often make the mistake of doing it out of anger or doing it out of reaction or doing it out of uh, just our, our flesh and, and doing it because it may just re relieve some stress. But no, it all it should always be done when you discipline your kids. It ought to always be because you love them. <clears throat> we love our kids so much, we don't want to see them ruin their life, so we discipline them. We, we love our kids so much, we don't want them to end up in prison, so we discipline them. We love our kids so much, we don't want them to be a spoiled brat, so we discipline them. And you know who our example is? Our example is Jesus. The Bible says in verse 7, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not. In other words, how can you claim to be a child of God if he's your father does not discipline you? What good is it to be a child of God if you're not going to be disciplined by your father? In verse, uh, verse 8, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, and are ye bastards and not sons? Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? According to verse 6, God disciplines us because He loves us. In verse 7, it's a natural part of being a parent. In verse 8, disciplining our children gives them a sense of security. And in verse 9, disciplining our children teaches them how to respect their authorities. I'll say it again. I'll say it really, really loudly so our young people understand this. Parents discipline their children because... They love them. <clears throat> Look at number four, please. Also in verse nine, the goal of discipline is to teach obedience. I go back to talking about uh, Coach Butch, Coach Chaffin. The reason why when your swing was terrible... He would tell you your swing is terrible and he'd show you how to have a good swing is because there's going to come a time in the season in which the team's going to need you to get a hit. And so he told you here's wrong and here's how to do right because you're going to have to do that one day in the future. If you miss a ground ball because your form is all terrible, he tells you your form is terrible. He shows you what good form is because in the season there's going to come a time when they're going to hit you the ball and he wants you to catch it. And we discipline our children because we want them to be obedient. We want them to do right. I'll read verse 9 again. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which correcteth us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? We do that to teach them obedience. And the only way our kids are going to learn is if, is if we teach them. I told you before, and you know this about my... My parents, my parents were not godly parents at all. I was not raised at all in anything close to a Christian home. But I thank God for my parents disciplined me when I needed it. 
when I was disobedient, I paid the price. Almost with my life sometimes. And when I, when I said a bad word, I ate soap. It taught me not to say bad words. And glory to God, I don't say bad words anymore. It worked. When I was a little kid, I was, uh, I don't know, 9 or 10 years old, I stole a little bottle of, of cologne from the store, and I got, oh my goodness, so much trouble for that. I take it back to the store, had to go to the store manager and explain why I did what I did. I was disciplined, I was told that was not right, I was shown what to do that to make it right, and since that point, I have not ever stolen anything else. It worked. I lied to my dad one time, and I had to stand in front of my Cub Scout troop and tell my Cub Scout troop that I lied to my dad. I got in trouble for it. Guess what? As far as I know, I haven't lied very often since then. Uh, it worked. But laughing. When I talk back to my mom, oh, my soul, I paid the price. I got hit with whatever was in range, a shoe, a, a belt, a stick, whatever. And uh, I mean, mama, she could, whew, I mean, she could sling a shoe. Flip-flop, whatever, sandal, house shoe, didn't matter, spoon, whatever. If it was close, she'd get it. And guess what? I didn't talk back to my mom very often after that. I came home late for supper one time. I went to bed without my supper that night. I was disciplined. And as far as I can remember, I never once again was late for supper. One time I... Changed the grade on my report card. You know, back in the day when I went to school, the, parent, the teachers would, on a piece of cardboard, write an A, a B, a C, a D, or whatever. And it was sort of easy to change, like a, a, a D to an A kind of thing. And I, I did that once. Once. And I paid the price. I was disciplined for my sin. It taught me to be obedient. And this thing I can promise you, I never once again change another grade. Here's my point. We discipline our children to teach them obedience. It worked with me. I set my brother's bed on fire when I was seven years old. I'll never forget it as long as I live. My dad got me with that 1970s thick leather white belt, you know, 17 times. I counted. I relived that over and over and over again. Had to sleep in that bed that night. The fireman who came to the house was also my bus driver. So it got all over, all over school that stay away from the Grimes boy. He's a pyromaniac. He may burn your house down. I got in so much trouble, but guess what? I never, ever again set my brother's bed on fire. And wouldn't you know what? I became a firefighter. Isn't that interesting how that works? I'll say it again. We discipline our children because we want to teach them obedience. That's why God does that to us. That's why He does not let us sin and get by with Him. He wants us to do right. He wants us to obey Him and walk with Him and follow Him. And when we get off course, when we get out of line, when we get off the straight way, He gets us back on. He does that so because He loves us and because He wants us to be obedient. An obedient Christian is a much better Christian than a disobedient Christian. <clears throat> Number five, and I'll be done. Look at verse 10 and verse 11. Number five, the result of discipline is short-term pain and long-term gain. Short-term pain and long-term gain. Look in verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit... In other words, sometimes uh, our earthly fathers, because it makes them feel better, they get their frustration out, so they'll discipline us. But God doesn't do it that way. He does it for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. Now, no chastening, listen carefully, please, for the present seemeth joyous. Nobody likes getting a spanking. Nobody likes having God rebuke them. Nobody likes getting in trouble. But grievous, nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth. That's the key thought there. Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. The result of discipline is short-term pain and long-term gain. It hurts for a while, but in the long run, it helps. 
I've often talked about the way Andy Griffith does it. Or uh, the, the Beaver's dad, uh, Mr. Beaver, Ward, Ward, no, Ward, Beaver, Cleaver, Ward, uh, Cleaver, yeah, Ward Cleaver. Or any of those good, clean shows back in the day. And, and parenting is not like that anymore. I, I heard a guy the other day say that we can't be the kind of parents our parents were because when our parents were parenting us, the world was way different. And it was. Just 30 years ago, when I was 16 years old, the world was way different just 30 years ago than it is now. And there's, there's I don't know if it's better or worse. I don't know if it's better or worse. It's just different. It's just different. But something that should be the same is discipline. We, we dis- listen, kids, your parents discipline you because they love you. And if you have a parent who does not discipline you, you might want to ask them, why don't you love me? The only remedy for wimpy parenting that produces wimpy young people is disciplining that produces disciplined adults. Would you stand to your feet tonight, please? And we're going to bow for prayer in just a moment. I wonder, maybe.